Hello, I'm Guy Merchant, Professor of Literacy and Education at Sheffield Hallam University. So welcome to uh, this symposium series, Beyond COVID. So I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me and also to thank UKLA for organising this symposium in the first place. So my talk is called Literacy After Lockdown and is a series of personal reflections around the topic and it proceeds through four interlinked sections. So I'll share my screen and begin. On Monday the 8th of March, children in England returned to their classrooms for the first time since lockdown. I knew because I heard them clattering past my house on the way to school. There was an exuberant atmosphere, much swinging of bags, slamming of doors, rattling of gates, and there were voices too, some subdued, some loud and unruly, reminding me of how all these diverse forces are so often overlooked reined in and brought to serve adult purposes. I find myself in sympathy with the work of scholars who wish to dislodge reductive accounts of meaning making and those who seek to counter reductive ideas about what children learning in school are and could be. Yes, on that Monday morning, there was an almost palpable sense of relief. Children were back in school, they were back together, and it underlined my understanding of how children thrive in each other's company, as well as through the sensitive guidance of adults and teachers. Of course, there may have been some reluctance, children who were less excited, worried, anxious and uncertain, but all told, these events brought home the crucially important way in which public education provides spaces for children to be together not only in classrooms and other places designed for learning, but also at the school gate in playgrounds and in corridors. These spaces tend to be less regulated, but they're spaces in which the energy of childhood culture thrives, where children play and interact, often under the watchful eye of adults, but not usually under their explicit guidance. In this way, early education provision has always provided so much more than the formal learning on offer. And unsurprisingly, this is a large part of what children and their parents had missed. Parents have been thrown back on their own resources, often heroically supported by teachers who labored under extremely difficult circumstances to provide learning opportunities remotely. So being back together feels like something worth celebrating. That said, I don't subscribe to the idea that children are now massively behind or that they should be subjected to additional days and hours of study. These sort of arguments seem to come from an outdated view of children who are seem to be like empty tanks topped up daily with new content, a view often held by those who mistake the arbitrary construction of age-related norms for some sort of objective truth. If anything, we need something more like the summer play schemes which used to be modestly funded by local government. School premises were vacant, the curriculum was forgotten and the normal rules of engagement could be renegotiated. Volunteer teachers and parents worked together informally to organise games, creative activities and outings for children of all ages and above all children could be children together in a loosely structured permissive context, they could play together. So what happened to play? A sorry image of lockdown was the abandoned playground in the field down the road. The swings were wrapped up around their frame and padlocked so they couldn't be used. The slide and roundabout swathed in red and white tape, a sign COVID-19 out of use was staked to the ground. At the time, all the talk was about when children might get back to school again, less about when the playgrounds might open, how they may, might fall behind rather than when they might jump about. 
So what happened to play? Well, some of the answers can be found in Helen Dodd's British Children's Play Survey published last month. Basically, the last 40 years have seen the steady erosion of time and space of play, the steady backwash of a narrow school curriculum, the selling of playing fields by cash-strapped local authorities, moral panic about the safety of children in public spaces, and so the list goes on. The British Children's Play Survey clearly underlines the importance of public play spaces, playgrounds, green spaces, and all the rest. Adventurous play that keeps safety and cost in perspective, rather than making them the ruling considerations. And importantly, parents and caregivers' attitudes and beliefs. This last is particularly telling because our attitudes and beliefs about childhood play and early literacy are crucial here. We need to reinstall the importance of play and playing together in our discourses of childhood. In short, we need to restate the benefits of play. So what about literacy? There's not enough time to fully tease out the crucial link between being together, playing together, and the beginnings of literacy. But a few words may help. In 2001, Jackie Marsh and I approached Kathy Roscos and Jim Christie to write for the very first issue of the Journal of Early Childhood Literacy, their paper, The Play Literacy Interface, now 20 years old, remains one of the most important and searchingly written in the field. Whilst play should not be the handmaiden of literacy, Roscos and Christie argue that there is strong evidence that play can provide a rich setting for literacy activity, skills and strategies, that it can provide a bridge between oral and written communication, and that it can provide abundant opportunities to teach and to learn literacy. Play does so much for physical, social and emotional well-being, for creativity and so much more. It should not be reduced. But then literacy as human communication is itself quintessentially social in nature. It expresses and shapes the ways in which we understand the world. And as a result, it lies at the heart of the educational process. But if literacy expresses and shapes the ways in which we understand the world, that world that it speaks of is not fixed or given. The early part of the 21st century has been marked by a rapid change, by environmental catastrophe, economic and political upheaval, and now by global pandemic. At the same time, significant technological developments have impacted on the ways in which we communicate to the extent that everyday literacy has been transformed beyond recognition. So the key question going forward is how might an English curriculum introduce children to literacy in ways that are sensitive to the substantial challenges we now face? Thanks to technology, children have remained in contact with one another and with their teachers throughout the pandemic. But lockdown has shown us that for all its potential, online learning has a long way to go. And that is clearly no substitute for school and the vital role that it plays in supporting children's social and psychological well-being. But the challenge is greater than that. We know that children were more positive about writing in lockdown than they were before, thanks to the National Literacy Trust's uh, survey um, by Clark. Uh, Self-expression was more important to them. They appreciated the scope and creativity and well-being uh, that writing offers. But literacy is in danger of becoming atomized. Should we worry when the following extract is used to practice first and third person agreement? 
Rosa Parks was a determined young lady. She refused to give her seat to the white people on the bus, even though she, they, was, were getting angry. Her, their actions that day proved to be one of the most important events in the struggle for equality. Should we worry? Yes, I do. I worry that despite all the best intentions, you might just skip the meaning, the whole significance of the events described, the way in which they connect with the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters. And if the school topic is the Romans yet again, how does that connect with the immediacy of environmental catastrophe, economic and political conflict, and global pandemic. So what about education? Over a hundred years ago, the Scots town planner, biologist and sociologist, Patrick Giddies coined the slogan, think global, act local. The slogan has been put to work in all sorts of different contexts, changed and reworded by environmental activists and many others too. I want to mobilize it here as a way of thinking about education. Although pandemic as a global phenomenon is slowly being buried under Boris Johnson's hubris, rebranded as a battle which the UK is winning, what a small-minded excuse for national triumphalism, we should fight against this. Environmental catastrophe is easily swept away if it's not on your doorstep local, national and international conflict airbrushed out of the picture by complicit media. So I want to argue for a literacy after lockdown that celebrates children being together and playing together. A literacy that helps them to connect with the wider world that they find themselves in and a literacy that empowers them to grapple with issues that are important both to them and to all of us. In short, literacy after lockdown is an opportunity to think global and act local. <laughs>